dynasty deposed. 40 years ago, the people of Iran ended two and a half thousand years of Persian monarchy. The Shah was ousted, the Islamic Republic was born. Hello, I'm Adnan Nawaz. Today's newsmaker is the Iranian Revolution. February the 11th, 1979, the day that transformed Iran and reshaped the region. Millions took to the streets demanding the end to the rule of Mohammad Reza Pahlavi. They succeeded. They overthrew the Shah in one of the modern world's most significant revolutions. Iran went from being a friend of the West to a sworn enemy of the United States. And today, that relationship is as hostile as ever. Over the next hour, we're going to be asking whether the revolution lived up to its promises. But first, Randolph Nogle reports on how Iran's leaders are finding themselves facing an increasingly hostile opposition abroad. Forty years after its expulsion from the international community, Iran's reintegration seems more in jeopardy than ever. Both the EU and Tehran appear to be growing wary with the wavering terms of their 2015 nuclear deal. And the country credited with winning the agreement is now leading a strident charge to see to its undoing. The president said unmistakably our goal is maximum pressure uh, and that it would be to drive Iranian oil exports to zero. Specifically, Iran is tired of waiting to see the economic benefits of the deal. And if we are not to benefit from that part, then uh, what's the purpose of staying in the deal and accepting the constraints and the limitations in our nuclear activities? Last year, U.S. President Donald Trump reimposed sanctions against Iran's oil and gas industry, pulling out of the historic Iran nuclear agreement with the U.S., U.K., France, Russia, China, and Germany. The so-called P5 plus one deal was the crowning diplomatic achievement of the man Trump replaced, former President Barack Obama. Iran has been testing the limits of its own terms of the deal, test firing a satellite rocket in defiance of U.S. warnings not to. They sent up a rocket the other day, and it failed, but it was sent up. Now, they can say they're sending it up for civilian purposes, but I don't think too many people believe that. And last week, Iran tested a new long-range cruise missile, the Hovazer, which Iranian military sources say has a range of 1,350 kilometers. Days later, Iran unveiled a powerful new ballistic missile, the Dezful. We would like to see the European Union pass sanctions that would designate the people and the organizations that are facilitating Iran's missile testing and missile proliferation, both activities of which are in defiance of the UN Security Council. As tensions between Iran and Western countries have risen, the EU has only issued sanctions that don't impact the nuclear deal. This includes measures aimed at Iran's intelligence and security ministry for their suspected role in thwarted attempts to assassinate Iranian dissidents on European soil. The EU has issued a warning to Iran to stop such activities and refrain from any more missile launches in violation of UN Security Council orders. But even so, the bloc seems set on ensuring that Iran is able to benefit from the terms of the 2015 nuclear agreement. The UK, France and Germany have opened a trade channel with Iran named INSTEX to bypass US sanctions. Europe passed an era of appeasement of the United States. If you remember about six, seven months, they tried to appease Trump, and he humiliated all of them, with no exception. And I think then Europe learned, of course, late uh, with, uh, let's say, late uh, uh, time span, that it is a very different setting. But Europe's patience may be wearing thin, and it will ultimately be the global market that will determine whether Instex works. But you have to know that, in the end of the course, it's the entrepreneurs who decide 
si elles veulent ou non continuer à travailler en Iran. C'est elles qui décideront si elles le font en connaissant les risques des sanctions américaines. All the while, Iran too is demanding dividends for its end of the bargain, one which seems more beleaguered than ever. Technically speaking, it's very easy for us to go back to what we were before, even to a better position. In other words, we can start the 20% enrichment activity. And if this nuclear deal fails, making another in order to prevent a potentially disastrous conflict in the region seems dubious at best. Now, why should we resume another talk just because somebody doesn't like it? Just because somebody hates his predecessor? I mean, that, that's not the reason you engage in diplomacy. Randolph Nogle, The Newsmakers. I'm joined from London by the former U.S. Ambassador to the United Nations, Thomas Pickering. From the University of Tehran, we have Setara Sadegi, a Ph.D. student in American Studies. In Vail, Colorado, in the United States, the law professor Dave Jonas is there for us. He's also served as the Pentagon's nuclear non-proliferation planner in the Bush administration. And here in the studio with me here in Istanbul is Serhan Afajan Serhan is the coordinator at the Center of Iranian Studies in Ankara. All four of you, thank you very much indeed for your time. Can we start with a one-word answer from each of you? Okay, we've just had a report from my colleague Randolph Nogle in which he mentions that recent ballistic missile test that Iran undertook, also another missile which was unveiled by the military. Do we agree that Iran is technically in compliance with the nuclear agreement? Ambassador, one word, please. Yes. Setara? Yes. Dave? Probably. Serhan? I believe so. Okay. Now, this seems to be pretty much the feeling around most of the world. The Trump administration has its own very particular opinion about it. Ambassador, shall we start with you? You've written a piece analyzing what the Trump administration's policy towards Iran is. Do you believe that it's doomed to fail because of its aggressive and antagonistic attitude? I think if it continues a purely aggressive and antagonistic attitude, it will fail and it might produce conflict. It's interesting to compare Iran with the uh, North Korean approach in which the president tried much the same policy for over a year but was persuaded by President Moon Jae-in of South Korea and maybe others uh, to have a meeting with Kim Jong-un, and that has turned things around. So he went from all pressure, all fire and fury, uh, to love and romance. Neither is going to produce a useful result in North Korea, and probably not in Iran, but Iran has refused uh, to, to take up the romantic part. Dave, you're the only one who didn't say yes. You said probably. Well, Could you expand? Uh, I have uh, always been been suspect of Iran, as I have noted in my speaking and writing, because they have consistently violated um, agreements that are both that are legally binding. For example, while they have never been technically out of compliance with the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty, the NPT, they have definitely not complied with the legally binding safeguards agreement with the IAEA, requiring them to reveal all of their uh, civil nuclear programs, which they did not do for 20 years. They were literally out of compliance for 20 years. In addition, they were out of compliance with legally binding UN Security Council resolutions. Okay, well, that resolution in 2015, when the Security Council endorsed the nuclear deal, some of the language changed subtly. It said Iran is called upon not to undertake any activity related to ballistic missiles designed to be capable of, but the point being, called upon is not a complete directive. It's not a complete demand. And the IAEA, Dave, says that technically Iran is in compliance. So too does the CIA director, Gina Haspel. So too does the European Union. So what's going on with the Trump administration? Is it using this as an excuse to batter Iran? Not at all. I think the Trump administration did the correct thing in pulling out of the Iran nuclear deal. And again, while, while you're referring to the UN Security Council resolution, after the, the Iran nuclear deal was done. I'm referring to the UN Security Council resolutions prior to it that, for example, prohibited Iranian enrichment of uranium, which they went ahead 
and did, uh, as they did with a number of, of uh, UN Security Council resolutions, all legally binding, all of which were violated prior to the deal. So today, let's pick up on that. I mean, today is a very particular day for Iran, but if compromise is the one thing that the West wants to improve relations and seek a truly peaceful coexistence with Tehran, do you get the feeling that the leadership there would be prepared to compromise on any of the issues with which the West has a problem? Well, I don't think um, nor neither the leader of, the, of Iran nor the um, general public will ever agree to compromise anything of our sovereignty and our power uh, in order to come into, uh, I don't know, a treaty or a peace contract with uh, Europe or the U.S. because, um, as you know, the nuclear deal was not the only treaty that Trump administration has withdrawn from. Uh, the administration of President Trump has also withdrawn from other international treaties, and there is no guarantee whatsoever that Europe or especially the U.S. would ever stay with those uh, uh, treaties or contracts. So there is no uh, motivation, there is no reason whatsoever that Iran, whether it be the leadership or the general public, would ever want to uh, compromise anything of their sovereignty and their uh, national identity. Serhan, what would you say about that, well, about the possibility of Trump getting what he wants and having the nuclear accord uh, renegotiated? But he's got a particular problem with the ballistic missile tests. Uh, well, first of all, I would disagree with Dr. Sadegi on <coughs> the idea that Iran is not going to make any compromises. They are going to make compromises. Uh, uh, do they want to make any compromises? Certainly not. Do they need to make compromises? Certainly yes. Uh, as far as this missile issue is concerned, is Iran's missile program a problem? Yes, for the region and for the world. Is it against the UN resolution on the nuclear deal? No, it's not. Uh, the Atomic Energy Agency, for example, affirms that it's not. Uh, the European Union and p other parts of the deal, they affirm, they confirm that it's not, uh, it doesn't mean a violation of the deal. So this, I think that uh, whether it's a problem or not, and whether it's against the uh, nuclear deal should be, I think, differentiated because there is, a, I think, clear difference between the two. But uh, whether it's, it should be against the deal or not, Iran needs to make compromises against the Donald Trump administration because the Iranian economy is not doing good. And uh, I wouldn't agree, for example, with uh, Dr. Sadegui that the Iranian, um, Iranians, the popular feeling is against making any compromises. No, I don't think so. Uh, they want to get rid of this problem. They want to get rid of the sanctions. They want to get rid of the international isolation. Seth Reserha mentions the sanctions. Yeah, yeah, carry on, go on. Uh, well, as you know, I live in Iran and uh, as a female academic, as someone who is in contact with uh, a lot of Iranians, especially the youth, I can tell you that no. Uh, it's true that we have economic problems. It's true that the Iranian uh, public are uh, really demanding the government to do something about the economic crisis that we are facing. But because experience showed us that, for example, with the nuclear deal, nothing changed within Iran. Uh, it's true that a part of sanctions were lifted, but new sanctions were imposed by Trump. And uh, basically nothing about the uh, internal or domestic uh, economy changed for better. So that's why the general public uh, will not agree uh, to for the country <clears throat> to make any compromise unless there is a concrete guarantee for that. Like if we are going to give up on something, we have to be made uh, sure, we have to have some form of a guarantee that um, a part of these pressures from the international community would be lifted. Okay, Setare, listen, if you don't mind, we're just going to temporarily say goodbye to you and we'll bring you in to the second half of the program. Uh, we want to just speak to Professor Mohammed Marandi from Tehran University, who's also joining us. Professor Marandi, thank you very much indeed for your time. I'll come to you in a moment. Uh, but Ambassador Pickering, can you just explain to us, and then Dave, you can pick up on this point, 
why the Trump administration and also the European Union see Iran as a threat to conflicts that are happening across the Middle East and why it's asking Tehran to temper its involvement in those foreign conflicts. It's not as if this hasn't happened throughout history. Well, I don't speak for the Trump administration and I don't agree with all of their points. They see ballistic missile testing as something that could put Iran in a position to increase its threat to the region and perhaps beyond. They see involvement in both Yemen and Syria in what has become an internationalized uh, set of civil wars as making the problem worse rather than better from their perspective. Uh, they see the traditional concerns people have always had about Iran and prob uh, Iranian problems uh, with religious freedom in Iran, with human rights, with supporting organizations like Hezbollah and Hamas, which the United States from time to time has determined to be uh, terrorist organizations. So that's in the long lexicon of concern. The really crazy thing is, why should we give up a, a treaty that, in fact, limited Iran's capacity in a very serious way uh, to get nuclear weapons uh, in order to do nothing in return? Just bluster, just saying we're going to do a better deal, but not in any way at all succeeding. And why would Iran make a deal with a guy who violates a treaty? Uh, the treaty itself was made to keep Iran from getting out, uh, and there was no exit clause. There are only time limits. The United States obviously uh, got out, and it violated the treaty by doing so. So this is a, a, essentially taking a serious mess and making another mess to think that it might make it better, but doing nothing in return. And the Iranians, of course, are not going to cooperate, having had uh, the return they expected from the agreement. Uh, cut off by the United States. The United States, in fact, sanctioning its European allies and friends, allowing Iran to drive wedges between them, uh, and obviously giving Russia and China uh, a much more preferred position than they already have, something that clearly has not been in the traditional U.S. policy interest. So Other than that, a perfectly splendid p procedure by Mr. Trump. Ambassador, are we at the point where the White House is simply impervious to even uh, the advice that comes from allies, because many people would see the European Union's position as being more reasonable, certainly, uh, regarding their position that if you help Iran to do international trade, for example, with this new financial mechanism that major European Union countries have put in place, INSTEX, that that is a way to keep Iran on side. Is the White House not listening to any of its allies anymore on this issue? I'm shocked you asked Mike that question. The day after he was inaugurated, we were at that point, or maybe the day he's decided to run for election. He doesn't care what other people think. He doesn't care particularly what the Europeans think. He thinks they ought to pay more money for their own defense, and I don't disagree with him. But I think the notion that he's influenced by other people, he said just a little while ago, I listened to some folks who told me to turn it down, and they haven't made any progress, so I'm going to turn up the volume on all kinds of things like getting out of Syria, getting out of Afghanistan, uh, bringing uh, 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 Kim Jong-un into another summit, uh, hopefully with more preparation than he's had in the past. But the, the, the process of listening is not something that Mr. Trump either practices or enjoys, and that's quite obvious from what you've seen. Dave, what do you make of uh, the White House's intransigence on this issue? Because you've outlined earlier for us what the problems are, but in terms of the resolution towards them, is this really the right way to go about it? You know, I mentioned that uh, in foreign interventions are a part of the whole world's history. Just over the past 30 or 40 years, what, the Contras in Nicaragua, the Taliban, for goodness sake, who used to be the American allies, the Mujahideen, the YPG terror group in Syria. All of these are instances of the Americans getting involved in foreign ventures. And now they're saying to Iran that if you don't desist, we're going to impose sanctions on you, which, of course, they already have. Trump says they're the biggest and hardest in the world. First of all, uh, I don't uh, speak for the Trump administration either, like the, uh, the ambassador, but I do respectfully <laughs> take issue with a number of things he said. Uh, and I was, I was not the nominee for energy secretary, but the nominee for the general counsel of the Department of Energy. Um, the ambassador uh, complains that the Trump administration withdrew from a treaty. Of course, the Iran nuclear deal was not a treaty. It was a political agreement. It was nothing more than a handshake. Well, that's a, that's that happens to be a canard. You don't, you don't hey, understand international law. Let me finish. <laughs> I let you finish. 
it was a political agreement. It was just a political statement, non-legally binding, of political effect only. And it really bothers me when people act as though it was a legally binding treaty with withdrawal mechanisms, et cetera. But you can't do a non-legally binding treaty and then complain that someone wants to withdraw from it when all it takes is a policy change to withdraw from it because it's only a political commitment. Okay, Ambassador, uh, thank you very much indeed for your contribution. We're going to say goodbye to Ambassador Thomas Pickering now. Uh, we really very much appreciate uh, you spending time with us on the Newsmakers. And we'll go to Washington, D.C. and say hello to Jamal Abdi, who's president of the National Iranian American Council. Jamal, welcome to the Newsmakers. Uh, just hold on a moment there. Let's go to Tehran and speak to uh, Professor Mohammad Morandi. Uh, Professor, if we go back to just about pretty much 12 months ago, 13, 14 months ago, uh, when all of those huge protests were taking place across Iran. They started off as a, as a complaint against economic mismanagement. They became probably something else, didn't they? But then they disappeared. What would you say is the feeling amongst those tens of thousands of people who came out onto the streets of Iran if they were to get some sort of assistance from the outside world to change the system under which they live? Would they accept that assistance, do you think? Well, first of all, Today, which is the 40th anniversary of the revolution, you ha we had uh, rallies across the country. And in Tehran alone, it was well above a million people who participated. Yet, for example, when you look at the international news media like CNN just today, they were reporting something quite different. So I, I think one has to uh, look, into con look at the context. People in Iran protest. Some of them protest for economic issues. Some of them protest for political reasons. But when you look at the polls or when you look at the elections in Iran, we see that the country, the political order, the constitution has a very high degree of legitimacy in the eyes of the people. The last presidential election had a roughly 74 percent of 74 percent turnout, according to polls carried out by Western institutions like the University of Maryland. The uh, population in Iran strongly supports the Islamic Republic of Iran. So I think that instead of, uh, if, you're, if one is going to look at protests that are well covered in the West because of their position towards Iran and make a general judgment about the country, then I think we can also say that France no longer has political legitimacy because the yellow vests are out on the streets. So the president of France should step down. That's, I don't think the French government would appreciate such an argument and neither with its allies. So the only thing that ordinary Iranians want from the West is to abide by international law and to respect the international community. The Iranians have respected their side of a commitment, even though many in Iran believe that the Iranians gave too much in the JCPOA or the nuclear deal. But still, we accepted the deal. Our side is committed to it, and the other side isn't. Not only is the United States not abiding by the deal, and of course Trump has exited from it completely, but also the Europeans are not abiding by it. They are basically following Trump's footsteps. And they haven't, uh, uh, despite signing the agreement, the French, the British, and the Germans, and the whole of the EU has been abiding by U.S. dictates. So uh, I, I think it's a much, uh, it's very different from the narrative that we're hearing in the United States or in the West. The reality on the ground is that Iran is the victim, and the United States is the country, is the country that is violating uh, its commitments, that's trying to hurt ordinary Iranians. And it's aligned itself with despotic regimes, and it's aligned with those despotic regimes in starving the people of Yemen. Professor, I think that's a very valid point you make, that it's uh, almost impossible and indeed unfair to make an overall assessment by what we see on our TV screens, pictures that are beamed all over the world. And that's why you're on the program. And that's why, Jamal, we asked you to come on to the program as well. Because as an Iranian-American, you have a very particular perspective. Before I ask you for your opinion, let's play a clip of uh, President Hassan Rouhani, who has talked about how his administration is going to approach the antagonism that's coming from the outside world and how it's going to protect itself and behave. We have that clip, I believe. We have not asked and will not ask for permission for anyone to develop our missile capabilities and we will build a wide range of missiles that include ground-to-air, air-to-air, 
land to sea and ground to ground. We will continue along the path we have chosen and we will develop our military power. Jamal, with enemies like Israel, Saudi Arabia, the United States, why would Hassan Rouhani say anything different? The dynamic of Middle Eastern politics has changed quite dramatically in the past few years when you have Saudi Arabia aligned with Israel. Abdel Fattah al-Sisi, the president of Egypt, said just a few weeks ago that his country's cooperation with Israel has never been as deep as it is now. And all of this that the Trump administration is doing with Jared Kushner, as we know, his point man on the Middle East, is setting up Mohammed bin Salman as the man who's going to oppose Iran in the Middle East. How could Hassan Rouhani say anything else apart from what he's just said here? Well, I think you've, you've answered your own question. Um, the, the issue right now is that the United States is, I think some would say ironically, um, the party that is pursuing an ideological policy. Uh, whereas Iran, even if uh, people are concerned about uh, ballistic missiles or support for regional proxies, um, I, I don't think that you can make the argument that this is uh, not a, a rational approach to the circumstances that uh, surround Iran. Uh, I think that uh, you know other parties to the nuclear deal are also trying to pursue a interest-based policy. And for Europe, that means trying to sustain the deal. Uh, for, uh, uh, for the United States, an interest-based policy would be to try to build on that nuclear deal uh, and to try to secure additional compromises as part of follow-on negotiations. And you could really envision a parallel universe where the United States did stick with the Iran nuclear deal. And instead of having to lobby uh, level threats on TV and from thousands of miles away, you'd actually have a dialogue involving Iran where some of these issues could actually be uh, negotiated instead of what we have now, which seems to be an aggressive attempt to return to the status quo between the U.S. and Iran, now with a region that uh, has become so divided up and, and so uh, entrenched in this proxy battle between U.S.-aligned interests and Iranian-aligned interests. And without dialogue, I just don't see a happy ending uh, to this scenario. Jamal, how much is a case in, this kind of applies to quite a few of foreign, Donald Trump's foreign policies of Tehran having to wait until his presidency is over and then pursue whatever path is to be pursued? Yeah, th this, is, uh, this is becoming sort of an adage. I think it, it is true that Iran uh, is uh, going to try to wait out this administration. And the reason is because this administration is behaving as such an outlier, an outlier uh, within, you know, U.S. foreign policy. Uh, uh, you know, I think it's, it's in many respects a return to previous administration's policies, uh, uh, but the nuclear deal was a seismic shift. And to radically switch back and abrogate that agreement does not really jibe with what uh, America... Uh, is sort of supposed to represent on the world stage, a country that's interested in international order and, uh, uh, you know, an agreements-based form of diplomacy rather than just issuing edicts and sort of behaving as a, a dictatorship. I think if the United States was not so isolated on this issue, uh, if the Trump administration had actually uh, consulted with its partners and managed to actually convince any other country other than you know, Israel and, and the, the Persian Gulf Arab states, I, I think that it would be very different. I think Iran would not be able to wait out this administration. But because this administration is operating completely isolated, because there is no continuity between this administration and its predecessor and potentially with its successor, I think the rational approach here for Iran and the world is to try to sustain this agreement uh, as long as it can and hope that a different uh, political order comes to Washington after the 2020 elections. Okay, gentlemen, we are actually out of time, but I'm going to push it a little bit. Dave, I can give you 30 seconds to sum up where we are today in this situation. I, I think that the EU's recent statement shows, in fact, that they're actually moving closer to the Trump administration's position. I think that the Obama administration wanted to deal very badly and in doing so, neglected to include very important aspects of a deal that would have been acceptable to the world and the Trump administration, such as control over Iranian terrorism activity and missile activity. The fact that Iran just rolled out a new cruise missile, which they claim is defensive, but hardly is, 
is evidence of the fact that 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 the Trump administration was right in ending the deal because it's the missile activity and the terrorism activity and support for activity uh, in Lebanon, in Syria, in Yemen that is so troublesome on the world stage right now. Okay, Professor Morandi, 30 seconds, otherwise we won't be able to fit you in. Well, I think it's ironic that an American would speak about terrorism in Yemen when they are helping to starve the country and their allies are directly in contact and in cooperation with both ISIS and Al-Qaeda in Yemen. And it's ironic that any American would speak about terrorism in Syria when the United States document, the Defense Intelligence Agency document of 2012 explicitly states that the United States and its allies helped extremists in Syria from very early on and that the extremists were the dominant force and the United States supported them because of that. And it's ironic that Hezbollah, I assume he, he means, is a terrorist force in Lebanon when it was Hezbollah that expelled the Israeli regime when it was occupying half the country. And the reason why Iran has a missile defense capability is to prevent the United States, which constantly threatens the country, from 40 military bases that surround the country from attacking. What keeps the U.S. at bay is Iran's strength. Okay, Serhan, I promise in the second half I'll give you more of a chance. Okay. But to the three of you joining us from abroad, thank you very much indeed for your time, gentlemen. After the break, as millions mark the anniversary of the Iranian Revolution, we're going to ask if it's lived up to its aims. We'll also take a closer look at how life has changed for women in the country. From Tehran to Isfahan, millions have marked the anniversary of the Iranian Revolution. But is Iran better off now than it was 40 years ago? When Ayatollah Khomeini returned from exile, he promised to spread the nation's wealth. Many feel the gap between rich and poor is greater than ever. One year ago, the streets of Iran bubbled with anger. People were frustrated with the government's failure to improve the economy. Sandra Gatman looks back at the aims of the revolution and whether they've been achieved. When Iranians took to the streets 40 years ago, they demanded an end to two and a half thousand years of imperial rule. A city scarred by rioting in angry protests against the Shah. Their target was Shah Mohammad Reza Pahlavi, the head of a monarchy with close ties to the West, and a powerful military that fired on protesters, killing dozens. The demonstrations and arrests go on. By January 1979, the Shah had been driven out. The Shah and his empress left shortly before midday. For many, this uprising was about political freedom and ending corruption. But conservative forces fought for an Islamic revolution, a chance to reverse westernization. The man who from long distance had led the revolution to topple the Shah. The return of Ayatollah Khomeini after years of exile in France marked the start of a new era in Iran. But once in power, Khomeini abandoned early promises of free elections. He became Iran's absolute ruler, executing supporters of the Shah, imposing mandatory headscarves for women, and banning alcohol. For some revolutionaries, it wasn't the outcome they had in mind. Four decades later, a new Ayatollah is in power, and many in Iran are commemorating the birth of an Islamic Republic. Things are much better now with regards to the hijab and Islam. We are Muslims after all, and religion is our priority. But the thirst for change that once united Iranians against the Shah has been rearing its head. In 2009, the so-called Green Movement saw millions take to the streets to demonstrate against what activists said was election fraud. And in the last two years, protests have sparked up again this time in rural areas and even in conservative strongholds. These protests are driven by the lower levels of society who have been hit by major economic problems, losing their money when credit institutions collapsed. Hopes were high that Iran's economy would recover after international sanctions were lifted in exchange for Tehran abandoning its nuclear program. 
but unemployment remains at 40%. The youth have lost all hope in their future. There are many who want to leave, and they are right, because abroad they can progress and they will have a decent salary. Demonstrations soon morphed into a wider movement. Women activists called for an end to the compulsory headscarf law, and thousands of exiled Iranians with access to social media also chimed in to demand freedom for their country. In response, Iranian forces have clamped down, killing dozens and arresting more than 7,000 people last year, according to rights group Amnesty International. Displays of dissent may have been quashed, but without providing a cure, some suspect these rumblings of revolution could grow into something more. Sandra Gatman, The Newsmakers. Joining me now from Paris is Azade Kian Thibault. She is the director of the Center for Gender and Feminist Studies at the University of Paris. In Washington is Holly Dagers. Holly is a non-resident fellow with the Atlantic Council. She's also the editor of their Iran Source blog. And still with us from the University of Tehran, Setra Sadegi, a PhD student in American Studies, and also in the studio, Sehan Afajan, coordinator at the Center for Iranian Studies in Ankara. Uh, Azadeh, can you just take us on a trip down memory lane? Talk us through what Iran was like in the 1970s, not in the few years just before the revolution, but in the early 70s. Paint a picture for us. Well, actually, when it comes to rural areas, because one should not forget the majority of the population back then was the ruler, I think that the rural population suffered uh, from um, illiteracy. And the fact was that the majority of the villages, for instance, did not have drinking water or electricity. And a lot of migrants, rural migrants, uh, uh, to the big towns, including Tehran, uh, whose uh, population, uh, for instance, was doubled. Uh, from the 1960s to 1970s, and these people lived in shanty towns uh, in uh, uh, big cities. So uh, then it comes, when it comes to uh, uh, urban areas, uh, on the contrary, uh, we could see the emergence uh, and uh, uh, expansion of modern uh, middle classes uh, who uh, were very well formed either in uh, Iranian universities or, or abroad. They would become technocrats. Uh, uh, in the administration, and then we had also a strong uh, private uh, sector uh, because the Shah's uh, aim was to industrialize uh, the, the country. But at the same time, one uh, culturally speaking, we could see a, s a huge gap between westernized population, um, that is the tiny min minority of the population back then, and uh, the overwhelming majority of the population who uh, was uh, still very much uh, close to religious values. Um, and, and so we could see these contradictions between, on the one hand, um, cultural uh, policies of uh, the Shah's regime uh, to kind of westernize and modernize Iranians, uh, and at the same time, uh, the majority of the population, um, which was holding to these uh, uh, religious uh, or uh, traditional uh, ideas. Okay, I think that's a really, really good picture you've painted there from personal experience as well, of course. Holly, let's remind the viewers, if they're in any doubt that the country was ready for revolution, 98% of people in a referendum, whether those exact figures are credible or not, but 98% of people in a referendum at that time chose to establish an Islamic Republic. Can you just talk us through those moments of the success of the revolution and its early days and what people were looking for? I know that in the diaspora, there's a lot of discussion about whether this was actually an Islamic revolution. Um, oftentimes people will say that the Islamists hijacked the 1979 revolution. But when you look back in history, when you look at the chants that people were chanting, the signs, there was this sense that they wanted an Islamic Republic. And what they didn't understand at the time was that it was going to be the Islamic Republic that we see today now. They assumed they were going to get a lot of freebies. I mean, at the time, there were talk of freebies such as oil and free housing and electricity, and there would be equality and that things would be different. And at the time as well, um, um, Ayatollah 
Ruhollah Khomeini said he didn't want any um, role in the future of the government, which obviously ended up being the opposite because not only did he create the Velayat of Fahri, he also led the country as supreme leader. So I think at the time people were naive and hopeful. They were caught up in this enamor of change that they were going to get rid of what was then assumed to be a police state under Shah Mohammad Reza Pahlavi. And so when this election happened, uh, they voted and it got in the high 90th percentiles. But what it meant was that they didn't know what it is. They just voted for an Islamic Republic. Iranians neither knew what the details were. And as time went on, it became fact that this is not what they wanted. If you remember closely, for some of our viewers, on Women's Day, the Iranian, some Iranian women in Tehran also went out to protest the imposition of hijab. So some, there was a lot of kisms as the revolution progressed. But in the end, the big winner here was Khomeini and the Islamic Republic. OK, so one more question about history before we examine where we've come in 40 years. Uh, Sehan, every revolution needs a philosophy. You know, it might be populism, fascism, communism, whatever it is. It was an Islamic revolution in Iran. Would you agree with Holly that it was just a question of change and that it became an Islamic revolution? And how would that then reflect on what the country is today in terms of the people who are still around who wanted that change 40 years ago? Uh, well, uh, I wouldn't really agree because you wouldn't, agree, uh, you wouldn't imagine someone like Ayatollah Ruhollah Khomeini, a politicized scholar, having any idea other than an Islamic government. He wrote it in his book. He said it in his speeches. So he had in mind this idea of an Islamic government. The shape of it, the form of it came later on. But he always carried this idea of an Islamic government in one way or the other. This is, uh, of course, one significant part of the story, I think. And... Uh, but yes, I agree that, for example, the Iran Revolution of uh, 79 Revolution wouldn't have taken place had two things wouldn't be there. But the first one is the irrational policies of Mohammed Reza Shah. Uh, he was mistaken on a number of issues, I think. For example, his ultra-secularist policies was one of them, that he couldn't cope with the growing uh, uh, urbanization in the country, growing demands or the urbanite classes. Uh, that is an, uh, another significant fact that he couldn't remove the huge income gap between the haves and the have-nots. Uh, these are true. But the other, uh, I think, significant part of the revolution is that the idea that the problems could be removed by a regime change, it was there. And the leftists agreed on it, the Islamists agreed on it, and the nationalists agreed on it. And the only man who had a clear idea about the best viable uh, alternative was Ayatollah Khomeini. And he always carried this idea of an Islamic government, again, in one way or the other, all the way from the beginning, I think, at least through the 70s. OK, Saitara, you're the only person speaking to us, actually, from Iran. So you'll know that in the past 40 years, there's been a continual struggle between the theoc theocracy and the reformists. And the theocracy keeps winning. How is that struggle today in Iran? Well, I should uh, make this point first that uh, the reform, the reformist or the reformist party was not exactly the opposite of the theocracy. They were the ones who wanted or so, who sought reforms within the theocracy. And uh, the personalities that you see sit at top of the reformism, reformism are, um, I mean, are represented by many of the clergies, including Muhammad Khatami or um, Sayyid Hassan Khomeini, uh, who actually was also um, a grandson of Imam Khomeini. I should also mention um, that um, I think it's not very fair to call uh, Iranians' aspirations for a change as, change as uh, naive. I think uh, actually Iranian people very, were very sophisticated in what they wanted, and uh, as your uh, expert in the studio also mentioned, uh, they found that Imam Khomeini was uh, the only uh, leader who actually had a very exact idea uh, of uh, what an alternative government would be to replace the Pahlavi regime. People were really fed up with the inequalities, the social injustice, and um, the brutal uh, policies of the Pahlavi regime. 
And as for uh, many revolutions, uh, well, it is true that many of the ideals um, of the revolution have not yet been fulfilled, but the aspirations for fulfilling those ideals uh, still exist among the people. And this is this uh, dynamism among the public and this uh, uh, support for the general, for the overall establishment that makes them come uh, take to the streets every year um, and uh, and come to the polls to uh, you know cast their uh, votes and take uh, to uh, to play a part in their uh, political decision making of their country. So it's I think it's very important also to remember that for 40 years the revolution has survived despite all the hostility that it has received from. Uh, foreign powers, including the United States. Uh, and we have gone through wars, we have gone through sanctions, and uh, uh, obviously, like all other countries, we have also had domestic problems, including um, economic problems. Seth Array is saying that people are part of a democratic process. As the, I'll just read you a small quote here. Uh, it's a gentleman called Sade Zibakalam a political scientist, scientist who won a Freedom of Speech Award last year. He spent two years in prison under the rule of the Shah. He supported the revolution. He says, the revolution promised us democracy, the rule of law and freedom of the press. It promised us the right to freedom of opinion without being arrested and tortured. That's very straightforward. How much of that exists in Iran today, Azadeh? Well, unfortunately, um, you know, the revolution has uh, had three major demands and promises. One was freedom of uh, press associations and so on. The second one was social justice. And the third one was independence. When you look at freedom, unfortunately, it has not been achieved. Uh, several thousand uh, political prisoners have been executed in Iranian prisons. Uh, uh, several uh, thousand others are imprisoned right now, including bloggers, journalists, uh, uh, women's rights move, uh, 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 activists, human rights activists, and so on, or, or activists for the environment. And uh, then if you look at social justice, you can see that the gap between the rich and the poor, that is the richest and the poorest, has never been so important uh, than now. Uh, and of course, to this is added economic crisis, part of which has been aggravated by American sanctions, uh, and the only uh, slogan or demand that has been achieved uh, is Iran's independence. Foreign policy is independent. Uh, but my question is whether this, this foreign policy is, very, is really to the benefit of the Iranian population and our country or not. Uh, so this is an open question. But when it comes to freedom, unfortunately, this promise of the revolution has not been achieved. And I agree with uh, my colleague, Dr. Zibar Kalam. Uh, as they, uh, it's your special subject. What's the situation like for women in Iran today? And obviously, then we'll hear from Seth Areh, who's actually in Iran. Well, I call it one step forward, two step backward, the situation of women. Of course, women took active part in the revolution. And thanks to their participation, they could maintain their political rights that they have gained under the Shah. Nonetheless, when it comes to the civil court, to the penal court, for instance, uh, it is based on a very traditionalist reading of Islam. And uh, to the point that Iranian society has become really modernized, if you go to Iran, rate of uh, literacy, uh, the number of stud uh, female students in universities is 60% uh, uh, of all university students, that is over 3 million uh, girls are now in Iranian universities. Uh, for instance, the average number of children per woman, which was eight at the time of the revolution, is only 1.7 today, even less than in Turkey, for instance. So we have a lot of social changes uh, in uh, within the Iranian society uh, to the point that um, we can talk about a really modern society, but when it comes to uh, laws, when it comes to institutions, they are archaic and they really do not match correspond with the realities of the Iranian society and okay. with the Iranian uh, uh, women's population. Sethere, what do you say to that? You know, in the outside world, we see these social media videos of uh, young women protesting against the law that requires them to wear hijab, saying that we want to make our own decisions. That's a really powerful image that we're getting. Uh, what do women in Iran say? Uh, 
Uh, well, obviously, as you know, the mainstream media, especially in the West, uh, always highlight and uh, uh, kind of exaggerate the that those types of protests. I know I'm not saying that those types of protests do not take place, but um, as the polls show and as uh, you can observe within the society, still the majority of the women uh, do not have an issue with the imposition of a hijab because it was a part of the um, criminal law and the constitution that was uh, decided on uh, by the people. And if we are going to talk about democracy, uh, democracy is the rule of the people, the majority of the people. The majority of the people in Iran are still religious and Although there may be a uh, various interpretation of uh, the Islamic law, what they, what the majority still want is the the rule of the religion and the rule of the uh, the majority. Sure. Um, as someone who has been living, I mean, I have been born and bred in Iran, and um, so I'm talking about my own experience. Uh, yes, there is a dynamism. There is a uh, and uh, an aspiration among Iranian women for even more equal rights and even more opportunities. But um, as for freedom, freedom, I think um, there is uh, this very famous saying that um, as long as there is freedom of thought uh, or as long as people are practicing freedom of, freedom of thought, they will also seek freedom of uh, speech. And uh, women in Iran have been... Okay, do you mind? Yes. I, we are running out of time. Holly, can I give mm -hmm. you the last word? What are the big challenges 40 yeah. years after the revolution? What does Iran have to confront within itself? Well, I think the bigger challenges are the chance of what the protest surges are saying since the December 2007, January 2018 protests that continue to ebb and flow. It's mismanagement, it's corruption, it's the state of the economy. Iranians are growingly disillusioned with the establishment. And the Iranian establishment has also recognized this to an extent. The daughter of the late president, um, Hashemi Rafsanjani, has come out and said, we need to make these reforms or else we're going to end up the Shah, like the Shah. And so has President Hassan Rouhani. So while there is an acknowledgement from the upper echelons, the fact that they haven't addressed these issues, that they merely blamed it on the West and made minor reforms, but the fact that they haven't actually gone out and done something about it two years in, since these, over a year since these protests, I think that that itself is an attestment to some of the changes that need to be made. Having that been said, the Supreme Leader has said that they will be making these reforms, but we haven't really seen that happen. And so until some changes are not meant made to appease the Iranian people, I think that they're going to have to watch things carefully because not only are Iranians fed up, but they're also getting fed information from abroad about the state of their economy and whatnot. And so as long as they continue to blame the West and not address these issues, they're going okay. to have a bigger problem on their hands. And I'm not saying there's going to be a revolution or anything like that, but you're going to be seeing a lot more people on the streets in the near future. Azadeh, Holly, Setare, Serhan here in the studio. Thank you to all four of you for joining us on the Newsmakers. That's all for this edition of the Newsmakers with me, Adnan Nawaz. Do check out more of our stories on YouTube, Facebook and Twitter. Remember to like, follow and subscribe. We'll leave you now with these scenes from Iran where millions have marked 40 years since the revolution. Thanks for watching. Bye-bye.